Lee, I'm also a sophomore at the Cambridge School. Um, so yeah, we'll be your hostess host this afternoon as we um, attempt to give you all like a little glimpse of these um, four graduating <coughs> high schoolers' lives. Um, so we're going to learn about each individual journey that each of them took, their academic achievements, their hobbies, and all the different contributions to their communities. So, uh, and then after that, we'll open it up to a little Q&A with the audience. Before we get started, we would like to remind everyone that this seminar is not merely meant to be a regurgitation of these students' resumes or GPAs, nor is it only meant to focus on the schools that they are going to. It's really focused on the journey they took and the process that they had to get there. So that being said, let's just start to get a little, to, to get to know um, each of these students a little bit better, um, and some different interesting things about them that might not appear on their college resumes. So let's begin with Annie. Um, Annie is a straight A student at Canyon Quest Academy who will be going to Williams College next year. Uh, her passions include writing, music, political activism, and walking her dog. She hopes to study math and political science and pursue law in the future. Annie, you are also enthusiastic about community service and have volunteered a lot. Can you share some of your experiences in the area with us? Yeah, I think the, can everyone hear me? Uh, the most key volunteering experience that I've had has been with the YCC. I think some of you may have heard of it. It stands for the Youth Care Club, and it's a high school club uh, across different branches of schools, of which I was the branch, or the branch president for CCA. Uh, the, basically, the, the mission statement of the club is to simultaneously encourage volunteerism among teens and to raise money to sponsor the education of impoverished students in rural China, uh, with which I have personal connections because my father came from one of those rural villages. So that's how I, got, how I got into it. So as a participant in the club during middle school, actually, I would participate in cultural events at the Baboa Park and volunteer for the House of China, like helping them to sell food and make revenue so they could run the international colleges during the year. I also volunteered with the Salvation Army, environmental cleanups, etc. And then as I progressed through high school, I became more of an, a leader and event organizer for the club. So I'd help them put on talent shows to fundraise or be the one to organize the House of China and be liaison for the event itself. Uh, yeah, so in terms of how the experience has changed me, I think it's been a really core reason of why I've become a more mature and more responsible leader, because it really does take a lot to put on an event like this, for example, which we have done, and to make sure that everything runs smoothly, and to mobilize people and try to motivate them to want to volunteer as well. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Um, let's move on to Max right there. Uh, Max, or as we like to call him, MJ, is an accomplished Eagle Scout and a nationally ranked public forum debater. He interned at Sanford Designs and practiced CFO over the summer, and loved his time competing in the cross country and volleyball teams alongside his best friends. He will attend Claremont McKenna College, majoring at the intersection of neuroscience and economics, combining the two in a scientific man management major. At school, Max is exceptionally famous for his beautiful hair. Um, <laughs> Max, can you first tell us a little bit about Claremont McKenna College and also what has been your proudest achievement in high school? Sure, yeah. Um, so Claremont McKenna College <clears throat> is a small uh, elite liberal arts college right outside of LA. It's part of the 5C like Claremont schools. Um, I really was drawn to that uh, consortium where you have five colleges right next to each other across the street and you have access to all the resources. In fact, I can major at Scripps College or at Pomona if I wanted to, and I can take classes at all of them. So I was really drawn to that larger community, but also the small, tight-knit community of a uh, small liberal arts school. So there was only 14,000 students, um, or 1,400 students, I almost, that's not 14,000, 1,400 students at Claremont, um, so I'm glad to be joining that small community. And then my uh, proudest achievement, I'm inclined to say getting into college, but I'll say something different. I'll say, um, I'll go back to freshman year. Um, so referencing my Eagle Scout, which you heard about, my Eagle Scout project was to build a Gaga pit, which is like a play set uh, for indoor dodgeball and like a uh, court. Um, and I built that at my school. So um, I had to get some funding. I had to uh, clear an area, a bunch of bushes, and I organized this massive project to build this Gaga pit. And it was originally placed for the upper schoolers, and they had a lot of fun with it, but it eventually was moved to the lower school campus. And I'm so glad that it was moved to the lower school campus because literally there is a line of probably 50 kids every single day at every single recess for that one Gaga pit. So that makes me really happy that they're using my project and that I was able to serve the community and ultimately organize and 
uh, spearhead that project. Thank you. All right, so Sophia. Um, Sophia Chen has been a president of Tory Pine Science Olympiad, interned in labs at UCSD, created a science club for elementary schoolers, and played volleyball for club and high school varsity. Um, she will study bioengineering at MIT next year. Sophia, how were you able to pursue both STEM and sports so competitively during high school? Yeah, so um, I've been playing volleyball since fourth grade, and I've been playing competitive club, meaning we travel to different places to play tournaments. Like, um, we travel to LA every other week, every other weekend to uh, play volleyball. And at the same time, I also interned in labs and like did science Olympiad, so it was a lot of time commitment on my plate. Um, especially like for Toy Pines Volleyball, we would, um, we would practice for two hours after school every single day. We would often have matches and I wouldn't be able to get to starting my homework until 8 p.m. So it was definitely a lot to handle, but um, both of, the, both of these avenues in my life, I was really passionate about, so that's how I was able to do both at the same time. So basically, it was just a lot of time management and prioritization. Thank you, Sophia. Our next person actually found herself without a car through a series of unfortunate events that were kind of crazy. So she'll be here in a couple of minutes, but her name's Anna Claire, and she's my debate partner. And she'll be attending Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington with a full tuition scholarship. Uh, she'll be majoring in one humanities oriented subject and one neuroscience related subject. Uh, she was the captain of speech and debate team. Um, and she also did a lot of performing arts, including the school musicals and symphonic things. She was uh, also on the track and field team for varsity uh, four years of high school. And she's without a doubt the most extroverted, sweetest, and the most relentlessly positive person I know. So I hope that when she comes, you can all enjoy her talking to you about it. But she'll be here in just a sec. Yeah. And Claire does have a tendency to be tardy, but this particular <laughs> instance was not her fault. So. <laughs> Um, okay, Eddie, um, our final senior. So Eddie Lee is a current senior at Canyon Crest Academy. He is broadly interested in political theory, philosophy, and computer science. On campus, he is uh, heavily involved with debate, computer science club, and world affairs council. In his free time, he enjoys napping and playing tennis. He will study at Brown University. Eddie, uh, this is a simple question, but a lot of people are curious about it. How many APs have you taken, and what do you recommend about high school course loads? Um, so I recently, I just counted, and I think I've taken around 18 or 19 AP classes. That part of the reason why I was able to take that many is because I go to CCA, and we have an open curriculum, not open curriculum, um, we have like a four by four schedule, um, which means we take eight classes per year, so that's part of the reason why I was able to take more than maybe at some other high schools. Um, regarding my recommendation for high school course load, I think it's important to not limit yourself and you know to just take hard classes take challenging classes and try to do your best at them um, I know lots of people think they sometimes they get scared of taking AP classes or things like that but um, I feel like once you actually get into it and you do them you realize they're not as bad as most people think so I think it's just important to not limit yourself from the start quick follow-up uh, do you think that there's like a cap in terms of honors AP classes where you can either take a more challenging class or you can do better in a lower, maybe a lower difficulty class. Is there some way that we can navigate that that you would recommend? Um, I don't think there's a cap in, in like which classes you, you should take. Honestly, you can just take whichever classes you want that you think will help you, know, help you achieve your potential. And if you feel like you need to take classes that aren't AP, that's also fine, but um, I just recommend that you don't go in with the mindset that you won't be able to take hard classes going into high school. Thank you, Eddie. Um, now we're going to move on to a couple broader questions that hopefully each of our, or a couple of our panelists can speak to. Um, so first about choosing a college. So um, relating to the overall process of finding yourself through the entire college of admissions process, the most obvious culmination of this is actually choosing what college you're going to once you get all of your acceptance letters back. So while everybody's experience is different, um, we'd like to have just a couple students in particular share their unique experiences. 
So, um, Eddie, you were accepted into quite a few liberal arts colleges and ended up with a few tough decisions. Would you mind sharing that experience with us and telling us how you ultimately ended up choosing Brown? Yeah, so I had a really hard time deciding personally which college I wanted to attend. Um, my initial decision was between four schools. Um, it was between UC Berkeley with a Regents Scholarship, Williams College, um, Brown, and Duke. Um, so I started off making the process by just using, you know, a process of elimination um, to narrow down the list. So the first one, um, or I eliminated UC Berkeley because I felt like I wanted to have um, a smaller college atmosphere rather than, you know, a huge, uh, you know, because UC Berkeley is a very huge public university and I feel like it's easy to get lost in there. Um, so I knew I wanted to go somewhere where I would be able to take it better advantage of the resources. So that's why I eliminated UC Berkeley. Um, for Williams College, um, I want to study computer science. And so that's why I felt like going to a really small liberal arts college might not be the best choice for me. Um, and then, so towards the end, my choice really came down to be between Duke and Brown. Um, and this was a really hard choice for me, but I ended up choosing Brown because I felt like Brown had a had an atmosphere that really encouraged um, intellectual exploration. I don't know if you guys know this, but Brown has something called an open curriculum. And what this means is, is that there's no general education requirements for uh, you know the classes you're gonna take, so you can take whichever classes you want. Um, and I think that this results in lots of people having very diverse majors at the school. Um, so it's not all people who are, take, who are studying economics or just people who are studying computer science. There's also lots of people studying things like English, um, you know, art history, things like that. Um, and for me, I want to study both a STEM subject like computer science and a humanity subject like political science or maybe philosophy. So I felt like the open curriculum would really help me be able to combine those two interests. Duke also had lots of interdisciplinary programs, but I think it really came down to um, the atmosphere at Brown, that sort of intellectual atmosphere that encouraged uh, people to explore. I, I really like that. Also, the location for Brown um, is on the East Coast, um, which I thought would be better than being in the South, which is where Duke is. Thank you. Because sure, I decided where I was going to go to college a lot earlier than these guys in like November, December, um, when I, before I applied. Um, so I knew if I got in, I was going to go there. Um, for me, I knew Claremont McKenna just fit me. And I know that sounds cliche, but like I got on campus, and after the first like tour with the guide, I was like, okay, this is amazing. Like, there, there was like this glow about me, and it was like a warm glow, partly because we were in sunny California, and it was amazing weather, but also because I knew I loved the school, and it fit me. And there was, there was a small community that was focused on leadership, economics, and stuff that I really resonated with, and stuff that I really liked. So I think finding the right place for you is really important and visiting is a key component of that. And then beyond that, um, I don't know, you have to make sure everything else is in line because it's not just does the school fit for you, but um, is it close enough to home where you're comfortable? For me, that was a big uh, decision point. Um, can you afford it? Things like that are really important. So for me, those just lined up and it worked out. Um, it doesn't work out for everyone that way, not everyone. It, early decision is not the right choice for everyone, but if you can, it was one of the best choices of my senior year. So, it, it, I mean, it took off a massive amount of stress. I, I was going to apply to like eight more schools, uh, some Ivy League schools and stuff, and I didn't have to do any of those applications. So, I, because I was super happy where I was at. So, it can be very, very beneficial for you if you want to. And I knew that it was the right place for me beyond any Ivy Leagues or any other places that I should. And so if that's you, and if that's where you want to go, then go ahead and do it. Yeah, literally the entire school was jealous of Max because he was completely done in like, what, December, January? I don't know. And he could like play video games or do stuff he actually liked. <laughs> All right, question number two was about choosing a major. Clearly all of our panelists have a lot of different interests and it's very difficult to narrow down your scope of focus into one or two majors. So for example, let's look at Annie. Annie is planning on pursuing a double major. So how did you end up deciding to major in both math and political science? Uh, I'll talk about 
about political science first, since it's actually something that I wrote more about in my college apps. Uh, I've always liked stories, and history, when I read about it in school, was really fascinating to me, because it's like uh, everyone's big story played out in real time. And I felt like learning about those things that happened made me want to be able to impact that in our modern society. So I feel like political science is a more modern application, or like uh, using history in the modern context. So I applied to be an intern for Scott Peters' campaign for Congress in the 2018 cycle to get some sort of hands-on experience uh, like on a politician's campaign to see if that would be something that I wanted to do in the future. And while I don't know if I'll ever run for office, it was a really interesting experience. And I definitely learned a lot from people who were already in college, since a lot of his interns are college students. And I learned that uh, a couple of the things that they were studying in their own political science classes, since many of them are poli-sci majors as well. Uh, and Otherwise, I find political science interesting because of the way that uh, I was raised in like a multicultural household, and occasionally I'll ask my parents about what it was like to grow up in China, and I find it interesting to compare the different policies that each country in the world has pursued and the different places that it has led them to. So I'm interested in comparative politics as well as American politics in terms of what I'll study at Williams. And then for math, uh, I've always liked math. When I was a lot younger, everyone said I should, that I would go into math. That was before I started like reading and writing more. Uh, so I just wanted to be able to pursue uh, like all ends of the spectrum as opposed to just locking myself into humanities or social science. So in terms of being well-rounded, I felt like math is a really good broad foundation to have for anything that I want to do in the future. So that's why I had to pick those two things. Thank you. In both economics and neuroscience, and I know that Anna Claire um, is also interested in those things. Um, so now you're planning to double major in those two areas or do some kind of intersection between the two. So when and how was it that you became interested in each of these areas, and how did you decide that they were the paths that you wanted to go down? Um, let's see. So I encountered these subjects first in school. So this past year, um, I just finished up a neuroscience seminar with our teacher, and we're very blessed to have that at our school. Not everyone has that opportunity. So I was exposed to this, I guess, relatively early as a senior still. And I knew that this is something that I really like. It's not just science, it's like the cutting edge of science. Like we know so little about the brain and yet there's so much that we can still uh, explore and know. So I th feel like for me, that's the next, the next thing that has to be explored is the brain and how it functions and further on understanding not just how it functions but why it functions that way. So that was, that was the, like asking those bigger questions was what drove me towards neuroscience. And then economics, has always made sense to me. And I like things that make sense to me, and so I was comfortable with that, and I wanted to do it, and uh, Claremont McKenna has an amazing economics program, so that was that seemed a very natural path for me. Cool. Now we're going to move on to a very big aspect of high school, extracurriculars. Um, and as all of these kids are fitting the shape of high school, they not only excelled academically, but also participated heavily in activities outside of school. Um, and because this is a pretty big part, I'm going to open up this question to uh, Eddie, Sophia, and whoever else wants to answer it, because Anna Claire isn't here. So what was your best high school experiment, uh, experience in extracurriculars, and what inspired you to join that thing? Okay, so um, a big part of my high school experience was, as I said before, volleyball and also Science Olympiad. Um, I can really choose between the two of them. Um, but. Both of them, I really felt like I was representing my school, especially, so for volleyball, um, um, I play at Torrey Pines and recently won CIF, and a really like empowering moment for me was like being on that center court and like having the entire Cathedral Catholic student body screaming at you, hoping that you'll mess up, but then you don't mess up and you win. So like that's nice. And then, also, like, it, there's this feeling of like representing your school, playing with the top athletes, like in the in the county, in the state, in the nation, and like just traveling, like on buses. It's just amazing representing your school like that. And then also for science Olympiad, it's a similar concept. Just instead of sports, it's like science, like geography, and other random subjects. But um, yeah, as president of science Olympiad, it was. Like, it, was, um, it was a very good experience to like lead this club that so many people are part of, and yeah, that was fun. Uh, for me, I think the most formative activity I participated in high school was speech and debate. Um, it's the one activity I think I, 
I think it's the one activity that I stuck with throughout all four years of high school. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, I think lots of the things that Caleb said were really true because I feel like speech and debate was an activity that just really opened my mind. Um, like coming from middle school, <coughs> I was just somebody who had only really been exposed to, you know, lots of STEM subjects like math, like competitive math and, and you know, competitive science and computer science and things like that. But being in speech and debate made me read lots of different types of literature, you know, about things like race theory and um, political theory. And it, it made me realize that there, there's lots of other things that are really interesting. And it, it really opened my mind to lots of different perspectives. Um, also, I think that speech and debate um, I think the part about testing ideas that Caleb mentioned is really true because I know for sure that speech and debate has really um, like made me think about a lot of my own assumptions um, just about the status quo in general and it, it's, it's influenced what I want to maybe study in college too. Um, I also think it's given me a lot of opportunity to grow as a person um, and work with a team. Um, uh, you know, I became captain of our of the Lincoln Douglas event in junior year, and that really gave me lots of opportunity to focus on learning how to teach well, um, how to speak, not just in debate rounds but also out of debate rounds. Um, I think these are lots of valuable experiences, really valuable experiences for me. So it's also one of the activities that I definitely enjoyed the most. So yeah. I'll just uh, echo kind of what Eddie said again, just very briefly. I also participated in speech and debate, and it's also the only thing I did for all four years, I believe. Um, so it was definitely very formative for me. I did public form instead of, uh, what you do? Lincoln Douglas. Um, so I had a partner the entire time, which is, I think was really valuable for me because I learned how to have a partner and debate with them and not like were two separate people debating on the same side, but not really as a team. Because in that sense, I really had to learn that uh, small teamwork and be able, being able to communicate with my partner. And then we were able to become like perfectly in sync in rounds and like go up and know what the other person is gonna say and stuff like that. So um, it's definitely been really informative and it has broadened my horizons. As he said, everything that he said is correct. and You should do it. It's, it was very helpful for me at least. Uh, I'll touch upon something that I don't think any else, anyone else here is gonna bring up. Uh, I was really into high school journalism. I became the editor-in-chief of our school's news magazine in senior year. Last year I was an online editor-in-chief, but I've been participating in it for all, years, all four years of my high school experience. So as I mentioned before, I became really into reading and writing when I was pretty young, and I wrote a lot of like middle school grade poetry and like you know really cheesy short stories. But I also liked writing expository pieces and essays as well. So I joined our school's intro to journalism class, and then I, after that I advanced onto our actual like magazine staff. And I think what was the most valuable, valuable part about being editor-in-chief is knowing what it's like to really run the whole thing. Because as somebody who has ownership over the whole thing, you really, I mean, you really feel the ownership. Like, you know that this is representing yourself and you really want it to be the best and show, like, the best that you can be. And, you know, that entails making sure that your entire staff is on board with what you're doing and that everyone's able to work together. And also because our staff was really big this year, it meant you know, like destroying some people's dreams when I said that their magazine wouldn't make a cut for it, or their article wouldn't make the cut for a certain issue of the magazine. So that was really difficult at times. Uh, and because, like, be, be, being part of the magazine isn't just about writing or even about fundraising, there's also a lot of layout involved uh, and about recruiting people for the next year so that our staff doesn't die out. So I think that being part of Pulse is what it's called, has taught me a lot of different facets of working on different projects. And overall, I'm just really proud of the product that we've been able to push out for the past four quarters of our year. So I'm, I'm really happy that I did that. And I'll, while I'm not majoring in communications or anything, I'll definitely be joining some student publications at Williams. Apologies for being late. I had some car ride concerns. Um, so hi, I'm Anna Claire. I go to the same school as uh, Max and uh, Ansley and Emily. Um, I chose Whitworth after a really, really long process of looking at colleges. 
I was very interested in liberal arts colleges because uh, of the classical education that I'd had growing up that placed a lot of emphasis upon like humanities and literature and history. So I really love that aspect of liberal arts education and I find it really important to the things that I like to study. Um, so I applied to a lot of liberal arts colleges and what I was looking for with most of the colleges I applied to was special programs where I could get either lots of scholarships or like a kind of a special attention in a very small school setting. Um, because I really, I really value the, uh, uh, the community that comes from being in a small school environment. So um, I applied to a bunch of different schools and then kind of added Whitworth on as almost like a last minute decision. I didn't even really know that they offered full tuition scholarships or that they had an honors program, but uh, my friend told me to apply, so I did. And then the plans that I had with some of the other schools just didn't work out. I was applying to programs and I was getting accepted, but they weren't feeling like the right fit. So then I, my dad encouraged me to go to this scholarship weekend and I went and I just absolutely fell in love with the school. It had a really great community. Um, it had great teachers. All of the students were super invested in their student life, which was a different experience than I'd had at some other schools. And um, I had a great experience with the scholarship that they offered me. As far as the majors that I'm interested in doing, I really, uh, like Max, I really, really like neuroscience. So I'm hoping that I can do a double major that allows me to pursue something in neuroscience and something in the humanities. Because right now I feel like, especially in higher education, there's a really strong disconnect between the humanities and STEM. And I think that there definitely shouldn't be. I think both are extremely valuable and teach us a lot. So I'm hoping that I can do a double major to kind of bridge that gap and make some connections between the two. Thank you. Um... Okay, we're going to move on to our final question about time management. So it's definitely a challenge to learn how to manage your time, especially in the age of social media and constant technology-related distractions. So, um, Sophia, let's start with you. What's your routine for homework, studying, and extracurriculars? And do you have any tips for prioritizing your work, building good habits, or staying out of the cycle of procrastination? Sure. Um, so, for studying, and homework and all that stuff. Definitely time management is really important, especially when you're doing a lot of extracurriculars. So what happens is I usually have, well, um, during high school, I had practice every single day. So I would basically center my study habits, my homework doing like around practice. And having practice there would put me in the mindset that like I need to finish my homework before going to practice or else I'll come home at like 11 p.m. and still have a bunch of work to do. So definitely keeping in mind and, and prioritizing which things are most important to you. And some tips that I've done is that personally, I like to like micromanage my day. And a lot of my friends call me psychotic for doing this, but I basically like to list out every single thing that I'm doing in the day. And like, so have like a schedule, like from eight to 10, do this, from 10 to whatever, do this. And then also have like a list of things to do that I want to get done in the day. And that's really helped me um, because the added structure actually decreased my anxiety over like getting things done because it gives you a time and place to be having fun and a time and place to be getting things done. Otherwise, say you have like a project that you need to do, but you're out getting lunch with your friends. Well, that project will always linger in the back of your mind. You'll always be thinking about it. Like while I'm hanging out with my friend, I have to do this, I'm really worried about it. Whereas if you plan it out, you, you give yourself, okay, I'm gonna give myself this time to hang out with my friend. So you can have a good time hanging out with your friend and not have to worry about your project. So that's really helped me. And another thing that I've done is, it's called like Pomodoro or something. Basically, it um, you study for 25 minutes, you take a five minute break, 25 minutes study, five minute break, 25 minutes study, five minute break, 25 minutes study, five minute break, and then after four cycles, you take it a long 25 minute break. And the reason for this is if you do just like two or three straight hours of studying, you might get those two, two to three hours in, but then your brain is gonna be so burnt out that like you can't even get any more information in. So the, the Pomodoro technique is really good for like letting yourself rest and like have that, take a break just five minutes to do whatever your brain needs to regenerate. So yeah, that's it. That's really cool. Thank you. Uh, our next question goes to Annie, who's pretty well known for never procrastinating and getting all her college apps in early, which I might have 
trouble doing. But Annie, how do you discipline yourself from these distractions on the internet with your friends? Discipline. Okay. Well, I mean, I think Sophia touched upon a lot of things that I agree with very strongly. I'm also a person that really likes to make lists and cross them out when I finish them because that gives me a sense of accomplishment. And especially in junior year, when I think of time management, I think of junior year because that was absolutely crazy. I would write out everything that I had to do at a certain day, and sometimes I had like a lot, like schedules, like blocks of an hour to do this and then that. And I'd never finished everything that was on my list. I'm just gonna not talk into this anymore. Hello? Okay, I'd never finished everything that was on my list because I like to, to try and overreach, but at least knowing that I knew what I had to do was really good for me because then I would never let anything like fall through the gaps. And in terms of not being distracted by, what you say, like, social media or the internet or whatever, um, I don't know, I think I've always, I've been lucky. I consider myself to have been born this way because I get intense anxiety when I consider procrastinating, so I just never do. Uh, but that's not true for everyone. So in terms of disciplining yourself, I think setting timers is something that I've done. Uh, just to know how long it's been that you've been productive and to know how long it's been since you haven't been productive. And I think that the 25 minutes that Sophia mentioned is pretty accurate. I used to do like about 20 minutes. Uh, what else is there? Oh, in terms of, uh, uh, Sophia mentioned like taking a five minute break or a 25 minute break between activities. Uh, I tend to switch activities when I get bored or tired, but I'm always doing something that like progress, like that's moving me forward in the terms of the things that I have to do. So in junior year, when I was playing tennis and piano and doing school at the same time, when I got tired of doing homework, I would play piano. And then like after a couple hours of working, I would go play tennis or something like that. So it felt like I was always being productive, but I was able to like rest myself in different ways because you know exercise helps sometimes, and piano is a way for you to like turn off your brain and like go somewhere else and think about other things. So. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to turn to questions that are open to all the students in the panel. You don't all have to open it, but you don't all have to answer it. Excuse me, but if you feel like you have something to say, just go ahead and say it. Um, so first, I'd like to know, considering that we're coming up on summer. Uh, some people have already been released to their summer breaks. How did you five spend your different summers? What do you think was your best experience during summer and what would you recommend for how we might use ours? So uh, this summer after freshman year, I went to Cosmos um, at UC Davis. I did biomedical sciences. It was really fun. I saw a lot of cows. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, I also, um, in that same summer, I volunteered at the VA hospital, but at that time I was only 14, so I couldn't really do anything cool like in the hospital, so I was forced to work in the retail store, and I had to, basically they played that movie Zootopia on repeat, and I now hate that movie. <laughs> so yeah, I worked in the retail store, and yeah. And then the next summer, I did an internship at uh, Dr. Feldstein Lab at UCSD. I learned about liver disease, and then I, during that summer, I uh, did research for a science fair project, which I then did in March of, the, of my junior year. And then last summer, before senior year, I obviously worked on college apps, and I did another internship because my previous mentor had moved to Germany, but that's irrelevant. But um, I worked at the Cartilage Tissue Engineering Lab. Um, I did not participate in Science Fair, but I did contribute to an abstract that was published at a conference. So that was pretty cool. And then I also did, I also started a club that taught science to elementary schoolers down in Chula Vista. And we just did fun projects learning about science in an interactive, hands-on way, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so I've had similar experiences. I think internships are really important. If you can just reach out to people that you know, that's what I did for like my two biggest internships. Like, especially if you're offering like free work and you're not wanting to be paid, like I didn't need to be paid my first two or three summers. Um, now I'll be working for pay summer obviously but um, the first summer is like you don't need to be paid and you can do awesome work and not be paid and you can be with like amazing people doing like real work and stuff like that so um, I worked with practice CFO which is an accounting firm for dentists and I did a lot of bookkeeping and like actual accounting work that people go to college for and I was trained for like two days to do it 
And so I, I got that actual experience and I got to sit in on financial planning meetings. I got to do all this stuff. It was like really, really cool. But I think the other one that I did, the uh, Stanford Designs um, internship that I did, taught me like the meaning of hard work because I was a woodworker in a shop that was, the, on average, it was about 101 degrees inside the shop every single day. So we would, I would go up there and work for like five hours straight in the blazing heat, doing work, like manual labor, like sawing things in half, cutting it, measuring it, nailing it, doing all that stuff. So like do something that teaches you the value of hard work early on so that you can work hard later and then you'll be set. And then you can do stuff that's like requires intellect, like practicing a flow, doing accounting work. Because once you learn the value of hard work, even if it's physical, then you can apply it to anything in your life. So that's something valuable that I find. So um, I had a bit of a different experience in my first summer uh, after high school. So I moved from Minnesota to California. So we had this huge cross country move. So I didn't really have a summer where I could do like a definitive internship or anything. So I, instead I found something that I was really, really passionate about and I invested in that. And that for me at that point in my life, it was volunteering as a camp leader at a camp that I'd grown to growing up uh, and that I'd gone to growing up. Um, and even though that was only like a small portion of my summer, because I was super invested in it and I was really passionate about it, it didn't matter. And it became something that I could talk about in my college applications and show that like I was passionate about doing this certain kind of volunteer work. So I think if you have like a summer where maybe, you know, you're going on this big family vacation or you're moving or something like that, you can still make a lot out of your summer, whether that's through, you know, working on SAT prep and then also doing volunteering on the side or just finding like a passion project for you and being able to really invest in that and be able to point to it. Um, uh, I've also done a couple different like kind of internships. I did a job shadow one summer with some uh, lawyer friends of ours back in Minnesota. Um, so I got to see how that worked. And then I did a biomedical internship at uh, Sanford Burnham Prebis Medical Discovery Institute, which is a huge mouthful. <laughs> um, and that was really, really exciting. And I did a lot of SAT prep. I was not, I'm not naturally gifted when it comes to taking the SAT. So I had to work really hard to get my score to the spot where I really wanted it to be. Um, and even doing something like that, I think is a really good way to spend your summer. And then when you're in those college interviews and they ask you, how did you spend your summer? Saying that you did SAT prep instead of going to a law firm and interning is not like a unadmirable thing. That's still a hard work to do and doing that is very respectable. So make the most of your summer. Find something that you're passionate about and do the things that you need to get done and do the things that you're told to do, like biomedical internships. But, you know, kind of balance balance your life and uh, find both time for the things that you want to do and the time for the things that you think you should do. Okay. So for me, after freshman year, I think the summer before sophomore year, I think the primary thing I did was go to speech and debate camp um, to learn how to compete in Lincoln Douglas on the national circuit. I think that's the, the only productive thing I did that summer. Um, after sophomore year, um, before junior year, one of the main things I did was help, along with my teammates, organize uh, Canyon Crest Academy's own speech and debate camp. Um, which we run every year, so that was a lot of work and figuring out lots of logistics and get, getting people to sign up and organizing volunteers and teachers and all of that. Um, so that was, I think that was a good experience in, um, for me in learning how to organize things well. Um, that summer I also did lots of SAT prep, um, so that also took a lot I think the majority of the stuff I did over the summers was after my junior year. Um, I went to these two summer camps. One of them is called Yale Young Global Scholars. Um, I went for this program in international affairs and security. And that was basically just like a lot of seminars um, and meeting lots of international students. So that was a really great time. The other one was a free summer camp called um, Notre Dame Leadership Seminars at University of Notre Dame. Um, and that one was 
for a session called Science, Ethics, and Responsibility. So yeah, we, we learned about that. Um, one important thing that I did over the summer though, uh, after junior year was, um, along with some of my uh, teammates from Speech and Debate, we organized this uh, Speech and Debate mentorship program for you know, low income and more underprivileged youth at the Central Library for high schoolers. Um, because what we realized was that lots of high schoolers, I mean, speech and debate is definitely a very expensive activity, expensive activity that can be inaccessible lots of the time because you have to pay for travel and coaching and all these things if you want to be really successful. Um, so that was something that I found meaningful doing with my teammates. Um, towards the end of summer, I also started working with a professor at UCSD um, in bioinformatics, and after that he asked me to work at his biotech startup, which I'm currently working at right now, um, and I will continue to do that for this coming summer. Okay, since I'm going last, I'll just touch upon some things that the other kids haven't said yet. Uh, in terms of summer programs, I did two writing camps for creative writing after the end of my sophomore year and the end of my junior year. The first one was called the Juniper Institute for Young Writers, and the second one was uh, at Kenyon College in Ohio. So that's all of corn. Um, but the great thing about the fact that it was in Ohio is that it was in a very like peaceful, secluded area, and pretty much all you can do is write. So there were some activities where we'd go outside and like sit under the trees and write a poem about what you're seeing as you sit under the trees. And as somebody who you know enjoys writing and enjoys being outside, I think it was a really like, pleasant experience to be able to have a week or two weeks dedicated entirely to that like creative pursuit. Because in you know our busy everyday lives, it's really hard to be able to find time to sit down and try to let like words come out of you. Uh, anyone who's ever tried to write you know a college application essay knows how hard that can be. Uh, and actually, recently I tried to write a poem every day for an entire year, and I made it about one month. And I'm, I'm working on I'm on a hiatus right now. Uh, but yeah, so that was something that I found was uh, really good for my own passions because it's not something that necessarily goes directly on your resume, but I've been working towards like submitting writing for competitions like the Scholastic <laughs> Art Writing Awards and getting it published on like online literary magazines and things like that. But it's really just something that I enjoy and that I think is, an, is, is going to be an important part of my life because I'll always want to keep writing. Um, something else? I mentioned before that I interned for Scott Peters, so that's something that I did over the summer after my junior year as well. Uh, so I'll just go into uh, more detail about what that entailed. As an intern, we're pretty much just free labor, as Max said. So they would use this to phone bank. Uh, I would do like four hour shifts of phone banking, so they'd give us lists of phone numbers, or they'd have us go on this computer program that would automatically run numbers for you. And we'd call constituents, like in the district, and ask them if they'd heard of the candidate, if they were thinking of voting for him, etc. So it was collecting data for his campaign office, as well as trying to persuade voters that he's the right man for the job. Uh, and I mean, I've never been like a salesperson before, but that's pretty much what it was. You have to put on your like nice sales voice and be able to talk to read people on the phone and deal with like conflict situations. Uh, and we also did canvassing, which is going around knocking on people's doors and asking them pretty much the same thing, but you know, face to face, so they can't really yell at you or you know, call you bad things. Uh, so that was another lesson in like talking to strangers and interacting with people. And I think it's you know, it's honed my people skills. I've also gotten a lot better with directions because I had to walk around in all these unfamiliar neighborhoods. Uh, I'm thinking about investing in a taser or some mace soon because I'm still canvassing for a different candidate right now. But that was definitely a unique experience because it's not something that you do in like an extracurricular through a club or your high school or something. It's just something completely different from everything else that I've done. But I thought it was really um, entertaining and definitely character building because uh, it was a lot of work. And the third thing that I was going to talk about has to do with the first thing that I mentioned today about the YCC. Uh, because I visit China almost every year to uh, you know, visit parents or grandparents and see my dad's like family home, uh, we also take a team, the YCC takes a team of high school and sometimes middle school volunteers to go and volunteer in local schools in these rural areas. So uh, it's a lesson in how well we can speak Chinese, but uh, we try to teach them some English lessons as well and things about American culture that they might never be exposed to. And uh, we've also been trying to integrate like a public speaking curriculum because as some of you might know, in a lot of Chinese classrooms, they're not really taught to like, you know, be able to express themselves or stand up for things they believe in or even like articulate themselves because a lot of it is really rote learning and memorization. 
So we've been working on like self introductions and simple debates and just things to get students uh, more active and able to articulate themselves and be you know like better prepared adults later in their life. Uh, so I can attest to the fact that they are very hard workers, especially the ones who live in uh, more rural, more impoverished areas, because they know what it's like to wake up before dawn every day and to have to like work in your parents' rice fields before going to school and then walk miles to come home every day. So it, it is cliche, but it is humbling to see the places that they live in and to be able to live by, side by side with them and know that they're teaching you at the same time that you're teaching them. So that's something that I've been doing for two summers as well, and I'll be going back there this summer after senior year. Thank you for sharing mental health issues. So could each of you give us a tip about how you stay positive during times where <coughs> there could be a lot of pressure or stress? I guess I'll start. Um, find the thing that relaxes you and takes the stress away. So I know some friends that's working out, some friends that's watching TV, some friends that's eating, other friends that's, well, you name it, whatever de-stresses you, going to church maybe, something like that. Something that gives you perspective, I think that's the biggest thing. Something that gives you a bigger perspective on life, something that shows you this test is not the end all be all. And if you go 2% less on this test, it's not the end of the world. Like that kind of thing, giving you a bigger perspective, whatever activity that is for you, do it in moderation. Because some of those things can be really good, like working out is great, but if you do it all day every day, or if you watch TV all day every day, it's not the best productive use of your time. Um, so as long as you find those things and then you schedule them out so you do them in moderation, that's going to be the best way to limit mental stress, I, I find. So. Yeah, the, uh, I definitely agree. Working out is definitely a great way to release stress. Um, so I would say the top thing that stresses me out is like procrastination. So just tr think of it like preventative medicine. Just if you don't procrastinate, it will reduce your stress. Also, kids, don't let your parents get into your head too much. Yeah, uh, just don't think that, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, to you, what else? Yeah, let's just ask. Um, I would definitely say, like, be honest with the people in your life about what is stressing you out. I think it's really easy, and for us to try to be just like, oh no, like I'm doing fine, like I'm keeping my head above water, so everything must be good. And while I think that there are very, very specific instances in which that's an appropriate response, I think most of the time, honesty with the people that you're really close to is the way to go. So if you have a giant test that's stressing you out and you're really freaking out about it, tell your best friend, tell your mom, let them know, because it usually means that we're going to be less snappy and biting with the people around us, and if we are, they're more understanding. So I think honesty is definitely the best thing that's helped me relax, because whenever I can come home and tell my mom, like, yeah, I didn't have a very good day at school today, or I've got this huge project tomorrow and I'm very stressed about it, just having the understanding and the empathy that comes with that is always super beneficial. So tell your friends and your family how you're feeling when you're stressed. Um, so, for me, I think that, you know, having some level of stress is good as a motivator, but if you ever feel like it's too much, I think it's good to, maybe a good idea to split your day into times when you know that you'll be working and then other times that you can set aside for yourself to relax or do something you enjoy. Um, as Max was saying, I think that's a really good way of um, handling like extremely stressful moments. But I also think that, you know, just overall stress isn't something that you should necessarily be afraid of all the time because having like a some level of stress, I think it's healthy in, in terms of like making sure you're motivated and still doing the things you want to do. Um, and yeah. I mean, at this point, I think most things have already been said. But I just like to emphasize that everyone is different, and one of the most important things is to know like what is enough or too much for you. So in terms of stress being useful, I definitely agree. But each person needs to like test out and know like what kind of stress is like a motivator, a positive motivator for you, and what amount of stress is too much for you and it's going to cause you to, to crack or to break. And then uh, yeah, also in terms of getting to know yourself. Uh, know like what works for you. Some pe for some people, like taking a nap might help recharge you, and for other people, that just makes you more tired. 
Uh, I personally really like to walk my dog because it gets me outside and moving and I really like my dog when we're outside. Uh, it's easier to clear your head and just like look at the things that are going on around you and kind of remind yourself of the present moment and know that everything is fine. Like even if you're not actively studying for your next test, it's fine. If you study a little bit less, maybe you won't do as bad as you think. Uh, so getting some perspective, getting outside, I think often helps for a lot of people. Uh, so yeah, basically my advice to you is to try things and see if they work for you. And if they do work, then know that you have something to fall back on and always to be able to relax a little bit if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. A little bit less. Like I said before, I hate procrastinating and as a result, I studied a lot. And I feel like this, there's definitely a lot of time and effort that went into that that didn't necessarily have to. I could have enjoyed myself a lot more in other ways. And while I do think that like working really, really over hard in some years of my high school experience was, you know, uh, character building in a way. There are definitely things that I could have done to enjoy more. I could have explored more things. I could have played violin actually because I quit after I stopped having enough time to practice, but I really enjoyed the instrument when I did play it and I would like to start again someday. Uh, another thing is I wish I had engaged more with our school's activities, like going to school plays, school dances, and comedy sports matches, because those are things that are part of our school's culture that I feel like I really missed out on for several years. So I didn't really do that until senior year, but I feel like it was it was a lot of fun. It was a way to feel more engaged with like the greater community around me rather than just the people that I spend time with every day. So that's something that I think that I would like to improve on. Yeah, I I would be uh, I would act more uh, in like the spur of the moment. I think that's the thing that I regret the most or would change. I think um, it's in very important to plan out your days and like structure your work periods because like we've all emphasized that it's really really helpful <coughs> for working hard, but. There's the quote like, life happens when we're making other plans. And I think that's definitely true, especially when it comes to your friends. Like if people text you and be like, hey, do you wanna hang out? Do you wanna like do, go do something? I wish I would have done that more and like, or like initiated that more because those are the moments that I'm gonna remember like 20 years from now. It's not like, oh yeah, I remember that time I was studying for the SAT. That was good. No, I, I don't remember that. <laughs> I actually remember the time I was studying for the SAT and there was annoying people in the library that I was also, that I was studying it. I don't remember actually studying, I just remember things that were happening around me. And so I think doing things that are with your friends um, more and doing it, especially spur of the moment, because that's the stuff that's really fun and stuff that you're gonna remember. Even if it's like crazy stuff or like relatively crazy stuff. Um, like, but that kind of thing is really fun to do and is something that you're gonna remember, so. So I wish I cared less about what, what other people thought about me. Uh, definitely as high schoolers, we get caught up in like our peers and like being peer pressured to do things and what other people think, what other people's opinions are. But in reality, it really doesn't matter. Just you do you. It doesn't matter. But we'll think about you. Uh, for me, I wish I slept more and procrastinated less. Um, I definitely wasted a lot of time in high school, you know, on YouTube <laughs> and things like that. Um, I think that if I procrastinated less, I could have slept more and, you know, rest helps with everything in terms of like stress and feeling engaged with the things you're doing and, um, yeah, yeah. I'll second that for sure. Um, I think for myself, like personally, the thing that I wish I had done more of is I wish I had written more in my own journal. I, over the course of high school and especially over senior year, you write a lot of things for other people and you write almost nothing for yourself. For me, writing is something that really like fills my bucket and energizes me and makes me feel like I can externally process everything that's happening, whether that be like writing a poem about an interaction with a friend that I had or about a situation that I'm in in life or just about some nebulous existential crisis that I'm going through. Um, all of that like really helps me. So I think especially when you're doing something that you love for other people, make sure you do it for yourself too. Like I wish I had written more poems for myself in my own private journal. What about their own? Let me start at the other end. Yeah, there you okay. go. Um, be passionate about your friendships. Your friendships are not just, I think, so I remember very distinctly getting into an argument with my dad when I was in 10th grade, where he was like, why do you spend time with your friends? You're not even gonna have them in college anyways. And I was like, 
pardon me? <laughs> um, and I, uh, we had a long conversation and eventually he realized the ludicrousness of what he had just said. But your relationships that you have right now are going to form and shape who you are as a person. So be passionate about those relationships. The friends and the people that you surround yourself with, whether it be in your competitive debate team or in your neuroscience class or even just like on your bus, uh, like those are all people that are going, like the way that their attitudes and interactions interact with you is gonna shape who you are. Be passionate about those relationships and be willing to invest time in them and be spontaneous and all that kind of stuff. I would say to, um really dive deep in, into something that you enjoy in high school. I think that's extremely rewarding. Um, you know, just finding a, an activity or finding, yeah, finding an activity or a group of people that you really want to surround yourself with um, and taking that as far as you can. I think, yeah, I just think that's really rewarding because you get to grow yourself and, you know, really develop. Um, so I would say that's something really important. And the other thing would just be to sleep more. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with Eddie about the diving deep into something because um, when you're in high school, there are a million different things that you can do. Um, so it's good to try everything, but you should find the things that you actually enjoy because you can't really, you can't finesse your way into college. Like if you do things just for the sake of doing them, it's like, oh, I want to put it on my college app. It's not going to work. It's a waste of your own time because if you don't actually enjoy doing something, you should really find something you actually enjoy. And so, yeah. Okay, you guys kind of swung my mind. But I'll say something different. Um, what was the thing that I was going to say different? Uh, <laughs> okay, wait, come back. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't like being last for this one either. But uh, what I'm going to say is ask yourself, is this going to make me happy? And this does include, like, like you know, risk benefit analysis because I don't mean like if I play video games right now instead of studying, is it gonna make me happy? I mean like in a week after this test, like is the balance between the time that I spend enjoying myself and the time that I spend studying going to make me happy? Like find a compromise between what you know you need to do and what you actually wanna do. And I mean apply this question in other ways too, like in terms of what major you wanna do, am I gonna study this because I'm gonna make a lot of money? Uh, or because it's like what my parents want me to do, or because it will someday make me happy. Like in 40 years, when you're doing something for a career, is it going to be something that you really want to go to every day? Or is it like like the bread maker, and like you're not really sure what you want to do with the rest of your life after, like apart from your career? So I think that's something important to consider. And it's a lot to ask of somebody who really has only been like existing for maybe 14 to 17 years. But try to like ask that of yourself, and like self-reflection is really important. They ask you to do that a lot on you know your college app essays, and that's really tough, I think ask of someone who's so young and like unsure of pretty much everything, at least what I can attest to. So, but like work on self-reflection, work on asking yourself what you want and what you're passionate about, because that can go a long way in making sure that you're on like a path that you're gonna enjoy later on in life and not just following something that's prescribed for you or something that you think you're supposed to do right now. Okay, I remembered it. Um, the gist of it is that and life is gonna happen to you um, and that things are gonna happen that are completely unexpected. Like, stuff is gonna go down and you're not gonna want it to happen and you're gonna hope that it never happens later on, but it's gonna happen and it's gonna make you grow. And as long as you have like the growth mindset that a lot of people talk about, you can grow from all of those experiences. So I think realizing that a lot of high school is just gonna be weird. Like it's a weird transition period. You're finding more about yourself. You're finding more about your friends. You're making new friendships. You're learning how to make friendships, stuff like that. So like knowing that it's gonna be weird and just accepting that and just trying to grow from that to try and come out the other side a better person is a good piece of advice that I'm saying to you now. Yeah. <laughs> now we're gonna open up the floor for audience questions. Really packages. But I really like the fact that I feel like she actually got to know me and appreciated me as a person and not just as somebody that I can use to say, oh, she went to Williams that one year, or just somebody that's like bring money into them. Because I feel like she took the time to get to know me and I was able to meet with her in person every single week and like call or email her or ask her to look at my essay on Google Docs whenever I wanted because she had the time to invest in each of her students. Uh, and because she herself has like high school students at the moment and a college student, so she like understands better what I'm going through, I think. 
Uh, and while I don't think that every person needs to have like an essay consultant, like I can't say that I wouldn't have done as well or would have done better with a different essay consultant or with not one at all. But I feel like uh, in my case, it brought me some more peace of mind and I felt like I had some support while I was going through this because I felt like she knew what she was doing at the very least and I had somebody that I could ask uh, questions to and who would be able to support me if I felt like I was being overwhelmed because she wasn't like pushy in any way or saying like these are your deadlines or you have to get into this school. It was very much about what I wanted to do uh, and what are the best ways to express myself in that process. Okay, I don't have much to say about this because I did not hire any uh, essay consultant. I wrote my essays myself um, and that was that. I guess, uh, so my parents did help me quite a bit. Um, they definitely like, help me organize my essays and stuff because I had a lot of thoughts that were just like out there and then they kind of like help me um, organize it and also my uh, college counselor went over my essays to like read them through so in that sense I did have maybe a more involved college counselor than some but I didn't have an uh, essay consultant per se. So um, I go to a public school, so our counselors don't help you that much in terms of writing essays and things. So I did use a college consultant person. I used Hamilton. And um, I know there are a lot of mixed reviews from Hamilton because there's some degree of confounding between did this person get into a good college because they're a good student or did Hamilton actually help this person? So there's that certain degree. But um, in terms of college consulting, so how I wrote my essays was I wrote my essays first, and then sort of like the first filter would be like my own, myself, I'd read it. Second filter would be like my parents, they would just read it, screen it for anything that doesn't make sense, like I'd run through the ideas with them, and, and, then, and then the third screen would be the college consulting. And um, yeah, if you do plan on doing college consulting, I would definitely recommend getting someone to read your essays before going to college consulting, because yes, it is very expensive, and to maximize your time, you should br only bring in like, the best draft you have. Like, give them what you think is complete, and then let them read it or whatever. But that's just to like maximize time, get the best use out of your money. But um, yeah, I, for Hamilton, for college consulting, for some of my essays, he helped me a lot, and for some of them, I brought them in and he was like, okay, they're good. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and so that wasn't that helpful, but I guess we'll never know whether I would have gotten in with or without, so just never know. I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut you off right there, Eddie, because okay. we can get some more questions. Does anyone else have other questions? Yeah. I can start. Um, so in eighth grade, my mom made me go to a speech and debate summer camp, and that was actually how I got into speech and debate. And that was when I really found that, wow, like this activity is really interesting. That's what made me want to like pursue it throughout high school. So um, yeah, I guess you could say that my mom. I, I guess I could say that my mom forced me, kind of. Um, but it's not like I was like not open to it. Uh, originally at the time. Similar story, although a very different ending. Um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, the biomedical internship that I did, I did not want to do that. Um, it was like so much time out of my week, it was almost like I, I would be driving down and giving up like two entire afternoons for a very good portion of my summer. And I wanted to like get this other job and my mom was like, no, like you seem to have a passion for science you should go work in a lab and see what you think of it. And I worked in the lab for the entire summer and I realized like, yeah, I still really like science, but I guess working in a lab just isn't for me. The environment isn't really conducive to the skills that I think I have. And so I didn't like doing it at the time, but after the fact, like looking back on it, I'm really, really glad my mom encouraged me and pushed me to do that because she knew that like, being in that environment of the thing that I wanted, that I potentially had an interest in, would help me better understand and grasp, you know, do I actually want to go this route or do I want to go a slightly different way? Okay, we have 10 minutes left, so we're going to get okay. through.
So I did speech and debate in my 10th grade year when I first came to school and I really, really loved it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wanna do this forever. And I was like, I'm gonna get put with somebody who wants to travel and I'm gonna make this like my thing and this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of high school. And then that did not happen. I got put with a person who did not want to travel, who wanted to only stay local and who basically wanted to do the bare minimum effort unless I kind of like pushed them to do more. Um, so that was really hard. And I wouldn't like necessarily call that a failure on my part, although it was like, it was a great failure in my mind of like the plans that I had for my future. And that actually ended up being something really, really good because then I later got an awesome partner, Emily. Um, and what ended up happening was my values and my goals shifted. And I was like, actually, I wanna invest a lot more in my team. I don't wanna like go and travel. Um, I wanna like be present and I wanna help the younger kids on our team. So I think I grew from that in the sense that I realized that just like what Max was saying, when stuff happens in your life that totally doesn't go the way you expected it to, it's gonna lead to really good opportunities, like being able to invest in a team that you really love and make them your family. It's awesome. All right, we can go to another question. And if none of you have questions, I have a question. All right, yeah, I'll go. So where do each of you plan to see yourself going with your life? Do you plan to pursue a higher education and what do you think your career will look like? I think I mentioned that I'm interested in going into law after undergrad at Williams. Uh, I mean, none of my family are lawyers. I don't really know where I first got the idea, but I find it an interesting prospect. Uh, Scott Peters used to be an envir environmental lawyer, which I think might be interesting, but overall, I'm not really sure like what direction I want to go with that, or I might not even end up going into law after four years at Williams, but I'm also interested in like human rights law. Uh, I also think that it's a very romantic situation to be on the Supreme Court someday, although, again, I really don't have any idea where I want to go with that yet. It's just a very big direction. Um, so I'll be getting a, a science management major, probably a CMC, and with that, I think I want to do a PhD, ultimately uh, for uh, farther research and specialize in a certain subject, because I think that can be really valuable um, later on in my life. So uh, that's the, like, the farther education. And then um, as far as career, I'm definitely trying to intersect like business and science or economics and science. So uh, I want to combine those two things and because through my dad's experience, he, he works in biotech and um, through other stories that I've heard, I know that if you don't get the business right, if you don't get the business right in science, the science doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, especially if it's right. It can be totally perfect science and it, it'll just sit on the shelf if the business part isn't run right or if, the, if the, the, the people who are trying to run it don't know the economics of the, of the world. And so I wanna combine those two and really help people to get those drugs on the market or whatever I wanna do ultimately with my neuroscience degree because um, I wanna help people. And I think that's the ultimate goal um, to, to create fulfillment and stuff like that. So yeah, I wanna help people with those degrees and ultimately that PhD, yeah. So I'm thinking of majoring in bioengineering but I'm not entirely sure yet. Um, I'm sure college is for discovering what I want to do. But as of right now, I think it would be really great if I could get an MD PhD, if I could do an MD PhD and then do biomedical research. But that's still a long time in the future, and we'll see if that changes. So I don't know exactly what I want to do, you know, after college. But right now, I'm I'm really interested in AI, and you know, I talked about this briefly previously, but my experience working um, for my professor's biotech startup, I find, I've, you know, I found it really, really fascinating, just like the potential and, you know, the potential that AI has to do so many crazy things that human intuition can't even dream of doing. And that's something I definitely want to explore further in college and maybe someday I, I'll it's join. True, I think, especially if you go to uh, a school with a quarter system, because the way that all the classes stack up, if you're taking a lot of hard classes, a lot of them just happen to fall in that year. So uh, it's combined for me because I'm also a student athlete. So during the fall season, it was really tough for me to be on top of my homework while missing school like 30% of the time because I didn't take any free periods for um, getting out for uh, sports games. 
And I also did panel that year for piano, if anyone's familiar with that. And that required like hours and hours of practice during like the fun, like the end game part of the, the piano season. So basically I was just juggling a lot of things at once. And I have the same advice as before, you know, like write things out if that helps you, if it helps you stay on track and to set timers for yourself. And know that after that, after that year, it will get easier. First, you have to write a lot of essays. And after that, it gets even easier. And then you'll be able to relax and you'll have a summer to recuperate before you go off to college and study some more. Um, yeah, I, I think junior year is definitely the hardest. Um, for me, I thought that like, like December junior year was gonna be the hardest. And that was not true. It just ramped up from there. Like I thought, oh, I'll just get over this hump. Like this next <laughs> debate tournament is gonna be cool. And then we qualify for TOC, and then, oh, okay, after TOC, that, then I'll be chill. And then, oh, now I have SATs crap. So now the whole summer's SATs, and then after that, that'll be chill. But no, college essays are next, and now college admittance. It doesn't really end after the middle of junior year. Um, so also, like, literally up until a couple weeks ago, like, senior thesis, me um, you and know, Alan Claire had, it doesn't really end, for, at least for us, it didn't end uh, after I got into college. So like, there's been like a lot of like things, and just knowing that it, it does get harder, and but it also it like it gets harder, but you also get better at it. So like the, we have like a massive amount of growth period in those years, and you adapt to it. So it does get easier. It, the work does not decrease, but you you're able to adapt to it and do it better. Yeah, so for other people, junior is traditionally the hardest, but for me, sophomore year is the hardest, and that was because of my teachers, so it kind of depends. But for me, sophomore year was hardest in terms of like academics in school, and then junior year was hardest in terms of extracurriculars. Um, if you're going to be a freshman, please enjoy your freshman year. It's amazing. Um, if you're going to be a senior, first semester senior year is really terrible, but it gets better after second semester. Uh, for me at CCA, I think that I agree with Sophia. I think sophomore year was definitely the hardest because it's a big transition from freshman year to sophomore year. It's when you stay, start taking classes that require a lot more work. They challenge you more. They actually make you read um, like consistently, lots of text, things like that. So sophomore year was definitely the hardest, in my opinion, in terms of academics. And then after that, I feel like in junior year and senior year, in terms of classes, since you're a lot more adjusted to it, um, for me, I felt like it was a lot easier in that sense, but sophomore year is when you have to really push yourself and understand what it takes to, you know, do well academically, um, and yeah. I think my experience was very similar to Max's. Um, like, I felt like every year was the hardest year, and then I'm like, there's no way it can get harder than this, and then it did. <laughs> um, so I think every year recognizing that like what Max said, like you're gonna grow in skill um, because like by the time I got to my senior year, oh my goodness, like the entire fall of your senior year is kind of a blur and you're gonna get really caught up in all of like the college applications. Like my commitment was I really wanted to get all of my college applications done early. And also that's a piece of advice that I didn't get to say. If there is an early action option for a college that you're looking to apply to, not like early decision because that's binding and sometimes for financial aid reasons you can't do that. But if there's an early action option, take it because it will make your December so much easier and all of your friends are gonna be really stressed and doing all theirs and you're just gonna get to sit back and go, I did all of mine in November. So I think uh, bottom line, like yeah, high school just gets harder, but you also grow in your abilities to fulfill all of the duties and just continue to follow the rest of the advice that we gave and you guys will do great. <laughs> Thank you, so we're gonna go ahead and close. You've all heard of the famous quote, life is about the journey, not about the destination. So hopefully this seminar has convinced you to enjoy your four years in high school and cherish your teenage years of growth and development while you pursue your own interests and passions.